coming up on SciTech Now, a serious science with some sweet perks. The most fun part about my job is getting to taste all of the fresh ice cream samples as they're brought into the lab. Uncovering history using ancient DNA. I had the opportunity to go to Croatia, and while there I looked at, I think, over 70 human remains. And the story behind the story of NASA's hidden figures. Originally, it referred to somebody who computed or who did math all day like these women did. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Shireen Stanford in for Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching a special edition of SciTech Now. It's a women in science takeover, featuring some of the brightest minds in central Pennsylvania. We begin with a young woman whose love of science started on the farm. Now, it's taken her to one of the sweetest places in the state. The main purpose of my job is to make sure that we're maintaining the quality and safety of the products that we're making here at the creamery. My job's important because it helps protect the health of anyone who is eating our products to make sure they're not going to get sick. The most fun part about my job is getting to taste all of the fresh ice cream samples as they're brought into the lab. I'm Michelle Orner, and I'm the quality manager here at Penn State Berkey Creamery. Food science is definitely a growing field because people always need to eat, so it's definitely a very stable industry to be working in. Here at the creamery, we pasteurize and bottle fluid milk. We manufacture various ice cream, cheese, as well as yogurt. Some of the things I do on a daily basis is I do temperature checks throughout the plant to make sure that all of our coolers and freezers are maintaining the proper temps. I also plate all of our products for coliforms and for standard plate count, and that's to make sure that the product is safe. We also do taste testing of the products to make sure that we have a consistent flavor. I grew up in a small town in South Central Pennsylvania. Where I grew up, there were a lot of dairy farms around. And I remember actually going into the farm when I was younger and watching them milk the cows. I got interested in dairy because that was one of my favorite food science classes. You can do a large variety of different things with a food science degree from working on food safety, manufacturing other products, and product development. And some people even choose to develop a package that might keep food fresher longer. And I'm sure we don't get it very much. It was really important for me to get to have internships so that I could have experience within my major prior to graduating. It also helps you figure out some of the things you like to do and don't like to do within the major to help you better decide what kind of job you would want to have after graduation. I work with interns to help give them a basic introduction as to what it would be like to work in a lab at a creamery. Having a job in this field definitely keeps you interested because you never know what to expect on a daily basis. There's always things changing or there's always unexpected things that can happen throughout the day. One word can sum up our next scientist, passion. She loves what she does, and she knows it can make a difference. And she wants you to know that difficulty should never be a deterrent. When I first found out about forensic science in eighth grade, I would never have imagined that I would end up working in DNA analysis on old human remains. In my head, I was like, I am never touching a body, I'm never looking at bones, none of that. But this is exactly the right path for me, and the only reason I made it here was because I paid attention to what my interests were along the way. My name is Elena Zavala, and I'm a graduate student at Penn State in forensic science. 
I've always wanted to do forensic science, but I've also had this passion for music and service as well. Being able to use both my scientific side and my musical side help keep me balanced throughout school. And I just always feel more whole as a person when I'm playing music. I ended up working as a chemist at a startup company. They developed a new instrument for sequencing DNA. When I was in the workforce, I was the only female chemist in my group. Most of my coworkers were much older than me and all male. But I was also lucky that I had some really great mentors that were male. Tell me what you, like a result and then... I would definitely not be where I am in terms of my career path or studies in general without my interactions with other people. And not only did it allow me to learn about ancient DNA and human identification, but it also allowed me to exchange ideas with people who are also passionate about what I'm passionate about. I had the opportunity to go to Croatia, and while there I looked at, I think, over 70 human remains. Well, I traveled back from Croatia with those bones in my backpack. I really want to look at improving the current human identification techniques because unfortunately, there are a lot of terrible things happening in this world and there are a lot of people who are dying and who have not been identified and whose families are still looking for them. My grandpa's brother was lost in Stalingrad in World War II and so my family has ideas as to what might have happened to him but we don't actually know and so it would be wonderful if someday I was able to identify or find him and see possibly what happened or at least where he passed away. If you're interested in science, keep paying attention to what your true passions are. There's this idea, especially in high school and middle school, that if it's not easy, it's not the right thing for you. And that's not true. If it's not easy, it just means that Maybe you have to do an extra couple hours of work or maybe even longer, but if it's what you love, then it's worth it. The best part of my job, or at least working in the research I am now, is getting to do what I love. People think of science as you're in this lab and you never leave, which can definitely be true. I spend a lot of time in the basement, in the lab, but it doesn't have to be true. It's up to you in terms of what your passions are and what your drive is. The movie Hidden Figures was a smash hit at the box office, earning nearly $200 million worldwide. But before the movie, there was the book. It tells the story of the human computers, a group of black female mathematicians who worked behind the scenes at NASA during the height of the space race and the civil rights movement. Reporter Andrea Vasquez spoke to the author, Margot Lee Shutterly. Margot Lee Shutterly, thanks for being with us on Google Hangout. Thanks, Andrea. I'm really glad to be here today. So in your book, Hidden Figures, you explain the human computers who worked for NASA. Who were the human computers? It's really interesting, this term computer, because today we think of the computer, you know, and that we use to connect like we are right now, um, you know, in our telephones, our cars, our toasters. But a computer simply was a job title. You know, back originally, it referred to somebody who computed or who did math all day like these women did. So before there was an electronic computer, there were rooms of people, usually women, who did all of the hard work of processing and analyzing data that came from things like aeronautical flight testing, which is what the predecessor to NASA spent all of their time doing. So that, that is in a nutshell um, what these women dedicated their professional lives to. Earlier in history, around World War II, women got into computing because so many men were, were soldiers and were um, deployed. But what sort of precipitated these women who were working during the height of the civil rights movement and the space race? You know, just as you said, World War II, a lot of men, mathematicians, went off to fight. And this happened at the same time there was a skyrocketing need for aeronautical research because, you know, the airplane was a decisive factor in the Allied victory over the Axis forces 
was in World War II. So, um, but the specific event that led the black women to come to Langley was um, a gentleman named A. Philip Randolph. Now, everybody knows the name of Martin Luther King. A. Philip Randolph was a civil re rights leader in the 40s, you know, the 30s, you know, somebody that we all used to know and has faded from history. But he really pressed then President Roosevelt to open the federal government, the civil service, the defense industry, all of those jobs to African Americans. President Roosevelt in 1941 signed an executive order integrating the federal government. And about two years later, um, the first five black women walked through the door at what was then called the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. And that, that moment is really where my book, Hidden Figures, begins. And getting them into the job roles is one thing, but then what was the work environment like once they got there? Right. So the work itself, you know, the, the black women and the white women essentially did the same kind of work. You know, in the beginning in particular, they were organized into pools. So the same idea that, you know, you hear about these secretarial pools where there, you know, there are a lot of women and they would sort of send the work to the women in the pool. The women would do the work and send it back. Well, they, you know, decided this was also a really efficient way to deal with the computing work. But because this happened in Virginia, because it was in the Jim Crow South, the women had to be separate. So there was a, a white computing pool. It was called the East Computing Pool because it was on the east side of the campus. There was a West Area Computing Pool, and that's where the Black women were. You know, following the law at that time, they were in a separate office. They had separate bathrooms and a separate eating place in the cafeteria, but they did the same work as their white counterparts. So following the, the real pioneers in that, the initial human computers, what was sort of the lasting impact and legacy in the culture at NASA? So my father um, is, he's now retired, but he spent his entire career at NASA Langley as a research scientist. He came in the late 60s, and by the time he got there, these women, these black women, had already been on the job for two decades. We always think of, you know, men being the pioneers in civil rights and, and engineering and all these kinds of things. But the fact is the first professional African Americans at NASA were actually women. But these black women also opened the door and, and provided their shoulders to the next generation of black men who went in and became engineers. In, in so many ways, they, you know, they were on the job for decades. You know, they were sometimes literally hidden in the, in the sense that they were in this different office. But really, I think more accurately, we just didn't see them or pay attention to them. And yet, um, they were aeronautical ground troops, you know, ground troops of the space race. We wouldn't have gotten those amazing moments like John Glenn circling the Earth and Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier, you know. And, and we, we wouldn't have seen people who came, you know, later like Christine Darden, she was somebody who really was able to let her talent shine in her, you know, aeronautical uh, sonic boom technology. You look at the head of NASA, a black man, Charlie Bolden, and a, a woman, Dava Newman, who is the, you know, the assistant administrator, the deputy administrator, are leading the space agency. So, um, you know, I think the women of these, these, the legacy of these women lives on in, in so many different places around us today. And from what you learned for the research for your book and also from your father's uh, career, what is the impact of having diversity within an agency like NASA that's doing research and, and working on these innovations? You don't know if you have the best people if you haven't looked everywhere. It's about looking everywhere to find the best talent, bringing them in, and then giving them the tools and providing the environment so they could succeed. Because, you know, when everybody succeeds, the entire organization um, does a lot better. So Hidden Figures is a, is a really great example of that, where um, a door opened, these women came inside, and um, all of a sudden, they were able to help our country achieve some of the things that it wanted most. And I think that's really, that's really what we want now. You know, um, our, our economy today is based on technology. And there's a lot of talk about how is America going to be competitive if it doesn't fill these technology jobs. Well, I think once again, what we have to do is look everywhere. Because if we reach out and find the right people, I think yet again, we'll find that we're able to achieve more than we expected. Margot Lee Shetterly, author of Hidden Figures, subsequently made into a movie. Thanks so much for joining us.
It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. An all-female group of engineering students set out to design and build a hybrid race car. The result, a 700-pound, 82-horsepower invention named Hot Wheels. Now, the women are putting their work to the test. This car is unlike most others on the roads. It has four open wheels, not like a passenger car where it's all enclosed. Um, it has two roll bars to keep the driver safe in a rollover impact, and it has to be powered by an electric motor with high-powered lithium-ion batteries. The electric car is called Hot Wheels. It's the end result of a two-year project built by an all-female group of engineering students at the Rochester Institute of Technology. We have to do all the frame design, the parts design, all ourselves. Positive is always on the right. It's one of those rare moments when the job requires no experience. The students are a mix of different backgrounds and majors who have formed a team out of interest and curiosity to see whether all the research could pay off. We set out to do a two-year design and build phase. The actual design started in January of um, 15 and we went, um, designed all the way through about December and then we really started to build heavily in January of 16. With their eyes set on a major competition, the women put the finishing touches on Hot Wheels in early May. Yeah, Maura. You got this. Next, they were off to the races at the New Hampshire International Speedway. The tilt test is one safety check that ensures no leaking from the vehicle. 30 teams from across the globe put their creativity to the test at the Formula Hybrid, a design and engineering challenge for college students. Hot Wheels passed an initial mechanical inspection with flying colors, but later a close call would put the women in jeopardy of hitting the track. I slammed on the brakes and it was just way too much force in the front and it actually turned this, the bottom and the front suspension twisted over each other, so it completely just ripped apart one of our wheel assemblies. She was in the car, I was out of the car, so I had a different perspective. I just saw everything crinkle and I was just <laughs> like, oh no. Time was of the essence, so the women quickly put their thinking caps on. The mistake cost them a few rounds of the competition. Then, finally, the electric car remained powered up for nearly 12 miles. We came together as a team in those, the rest of that day to really pull together and show that we might have had a failure, but we're a team to be reckoned with and we're going to get back out there. We're not done and we're here to compete. Hot Wheels' brightly colored technical design won the team third place, and they finished third in the overall competition. But the women say it was a different prize that made this all worthwhile. We actually walked away with two professionalism and like management awards. When things got rough, the team found a unique way to lighten the mood. <laughs> we dance. <laughs> So the, I think they've never really seen that type of an atmosphere before where everyone just gets around the car and starts doing the wobble, but they, um, that's, that's how we build morale. And there's no doubt the hands-on experience created bonds and friendships they will take with them down whatever road they travel. We've seen so many girls, even young first and second years, transform just in this past semester, their level of confidence and understanding of things just because of this team. Less than 50 years ago, grizzly bears were on the path to extinction. Now, a group of biologists at Yellowstone National Park is mapping the bears' movements in an attempt to keep them away from new threats. Beyond the rhythm of water and the sway of woods is a wild sound. A grizzly bear snoring inside a trap. The key to being successful with grizzly bears is being patient and investing the time and effort you need to, to, to capture bears. A few hours earlier, Grizz number 1225 was unconscious on this makeshift operating table in the woods. Biologists took samples and fit the animal with a tracking collar. He's a perfect example of what a young male grizzly bear should look like in quality habitat. Beautiful bear. Grizz number 1225 lives in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Feeding bears in Yellowstone was once common. The practice stopped in the 1970s, but grizzly bears were dependent on the handouts. They had to learn to find food in the wild, go without, or be put down as trouble. They don't want garbage per se, uh, but if they find it, then they eat it and that's where problems come in. 
By 1975, the government added grizzlies to its list of species facing the threat of extinction. Their numbers dropped below 200 in the Yellowstone region. Today, there are more than 1,000. Is that a one year? 17. Okay, that's it. Ten percent of them are collared, so biologists can track their every move. Tracking starts as soon as the bear leaves the trap. People don't really understand how often bears actually move through this area. And it's a tribute to the bears and really their tolerance and really what they're looking for. A male grizzly's range covers 2,000 square miles. It's pretty incredible the distances these bears cover and why they do it. It just continually raises so many questions as far as we always think like we're starting to get a glimpse of what they're doing and then something new will come up and it blows your mind. Researchers like Nicole Walker follow the bear's path on foot. She checks the area for collared bears before she leaves the truck. If we hear a beep, it means that there's a collared grizzly in the area. Hearing a beep is bad. We don't want to hear beep. Static is good. If we hear a beep, we leave. Walker's trying to understand why the bear was here, but for personal safety, she doesn't want the bear to be here when she comes through. Help! She hollers often to make her presence known. Help! There's a high level of anxiety sometimes, but it's also a big thrill to be out here in bear country and investigating and seeing things that a lot of people don't get to see. Walker finds clues, a fresh daybed dug behind a log, and bark peeled back by a bear searching for bugs to eat. This research may help recovery efforts in other regions, like Washington's North Cascades. Knowing where grizzlies go and what they eat matters. Our research has indicated one of the big things that they're eating are ants. Ants are sustaining a lot of bears in the Island Park area, and you just think of an animal of that size sustaining itself on tiny ants. Ants, berries, roadkill, and yes, still today, sometimes garbage. Every year we have conflicts to where we have to go and try to manage a conflict bear or manage people who are making poor choices. Yellowstone's grizzlies spent the last four decades expanding on the landscape they share with humans. Now it's people who are facing some adjustments. Their population is growing and they're in places that they haven't been. And now it's at the point where we have to change some of our behaviors. The Greater Yellowstone Coalition is working with the Forest Service to bear-proof campgrounds. You know, it's easy to work with kids, and it's the, the parents or the grandparents who are like, I never used to camp like that, well, I don't see the need to do that. These measures aren't just to keep people safe, they're also to protect Yellowstone's grizzlies from the bad habits that got them in trouble just a few decades ago. My whole life, grizzly bears have been protected. They've always been this iconic species that is kind of hidden or really secretive and there's not a lot known and we're starting to uncover a lot of that to actually see them be on the edge of where they've recovered enough to where they don't need to be listed is a cool thing to be a part of. If you want to see more episodes of SciTech Now or watch more women in science profiles, they're online at wpsu.org digital. While you're there, check out the other great digital productions like Pennsylvania Makers. It features local artists with some very unique talents. I'm Shireen Stanford. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.